Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and this morning we're visiting with Josh Larson, uh, co-host of Film Spotting and author of Movies Are Prayers, How Films Voice Our Deepest Longings. Josh, welcome to the program. Thanks so much for having me. Josh is the co-host of uh, WBEZ NPR podcast Film Spotting. Uh, he brings his cinematic ex expertise to a new book, uh, which is Movies or Prayers. In your role with Film Spotting and editor of Think Christian, a digital magazine on faith and culture, you've influenced the minds of moviegoers on the applicability of stories to real life, spirituality, and faith for years. Uh, seeing how movies really do play an important and influential part, but specifically from your aspect of looking at uh, movies as uh, prayers or a way of releasing to the big screen our secret longings, desires, aspirations, dreams and visions, both in the natural and in the supernatural. Uh, Josh, have you always loved movies? As long as I can remember, yeah. Going to the movies was uh, a tradition in our house, so it's something we did regularly. A signature example of that, I think, is that when we would go on family vacations, even if we were somewhere new, uh, we would often hit the multiplex and catch a movie together just because it was part of our family tradition. Some might say, what a waste of a vacation to do that. You could see a movie back at home. Uh, and that's probably true. But for us, uh, it was one of the things we like to do together. So yeah, movies have been a big part of my life since childhood. Now, where did you grow up? What kind of home? Was it a uh, faith home, a church home? Uh, was it a, a, yeah. a, a, a G rated, a PG rated, a PG 13 rated? What kind of home did <laughs> would would you classify uh, that? That is the first time I've ever even considered giving an MPA rating to my home. That is <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> uh, I grew up as outside of Chicago in the Chicago suburbs, raised in a uh, faithful family, part of the Dutch Reformed tradition, uh, to be more specific. So uh, we were a home that um, took a understanding of God's sovereignty over culture, which meant that culture was a gift, something to be enjoyed, something, yes, as well, to be discerned. So my parents were discerning in what they allowed us to watch at certain ages and would talk with us about what we had seen. It was very much a family affair, as I mentioned, um, but it wasn't one of fear or protection so much as um, understanding that, yes, culture can be very good, but because it is offered and created by fallen people, just as we all are, that the good is sometimes alongside the bad. And so that's something to be discerning about as well. In this family tradition of going to see movies together, what was the dynamic, the dialogue afterwards? It's one thing that the family event is you go in together and you all have your favorite drink and you get your popcorn and you have that part of the tradition. Uh, who decided on what movie and what genre was the family drawn to? And what was the interaction? Were you the nobody speaks during the movie family? Were you the get up and walk around family? Or were you the family that everybody knew that at the end of this, we were going to wind up at a table <clears throat> in a restaurant and we were going to go around the table and give opinions and thoughts and applications. Yeah, conversation was always a part of it. And it wasn't anything that was formalized where we saw going to the movies as an assignment or uh, knowing that we were going to have a lesson afterwards. Conversation was just a big part of our family life in general. So that spilled into whatever film we happened to see. Uh, and it was only and it was mainly the mainstream offerings that we would see at the time I grew up. I'm talking about now, um, you know, mid 80s about is the time when I would be attending a lot of films with my family. So this was just at the advent of home video. We did some of that, but it hadn't quite taken over to the point that it has today. 
Um, these were largely theatrical experiences, and we'd see, you know, the the big movies that a family could see together in the 80s. So we're talking about things like Back to the Future or Indiana Jones films. Star Wars was a big part of my growing up. And then as We've lost our connection with Josh Larson, who is co-host of Film Spotting and author of Movies Are Prayers, How Films Voice Our Deepest Longings. We've been talking about uh, how uh, Josh grew up in a family that movies in the 80s were part of his life, and he found a way through his family discussions to begin to see that uh, movies represent uh, prayers, that there is in uh, each one of these films, there are messages. Uh, Josh, while we got lost our uh, uh, Skype connection with you there for a minute, I was kind of giving a little summation of, uh, of what you had just wrapped up with, which was the genre of movies that you uh, saw in the 80s, the Back to the Future, the Star Wars, uh, the various trilogies that were coming out at the time. What, uh, at this point, your uh, middle school, high school, uh, solid family background, what's the future vision uh, for Josh Larson? What, what's he think he's going to do with his life? Well, I enjoyed writing more than anything else when I was in school. So that was something I knew I would probably incorporate in whatever I did end up doing after high school and then college. And at the same time, along with this love of movies, I would begin to read a lot of film criticism. Growing up outside of Chicago, I was lucky enough to have at that time Roger Ebert writing regularly. Uh, Gene Siskel was at the Tribune, and of course they had their television show as well, right. which I never missed an episode. And so I would read a lot of other criticism and think this is the perfect coming together of my interests, is writing about movies. So that's really what I wanted to do probably since about middle school age, certainly since high school, and went on to study that to some degree in college. I majored in communications and English in college and uh, looked ahead towards possibly being able to do that as a career. And now back in this time, when I graduated from college, newspapers were still a viable operation. That was right. something someone could look to as having a career in. So I did go that route. Uh, I explored a little bit at that point about writing about film specifically as a Christian, but the way Christians were engaging with culture primarily, at least the ways that I saw and that uh, I encountered, were very different from that sort of approach to culture that I discussed when I grew up. It was much more confrontational. I'm thinking of the culture wars now of like the 80s and, and the 90s. Right. It was very confrontational, very fearful, and there wasn't really a place for my approach to faith and film uh, that I found that was comfortable. So I ended up heading towards the mainstream media realm and did begin to work in newspapers that way, eventually getting a job as a film critic at a suburban paper outside of Chicago. That being said, you now, although have a desire for a Christian point of view, you're now immersed into <clears throat> selling newspapers, the latest movie review, the box office hit, whether or not it was uh, in keeping with your theology, in keeping with your lifestyle, in keeping with your uh, morality, you are now in a position where you were going to have to give a critique based on a worldview as opposed to a biblical 
worldview. Is that, is that the position you wound up in at the paper? I guess I never thought about it that way. I don't see art in general or the engagement of art as being a clash of worldviews. I see it as um, a place to enter and join a conversation. And so by writing about whatever film might have opened at that time, that was my opportunity to join that conversation. And, and first of all, you know, before we even get to concerns about worldviews is take the piece of art, so the movie at hand, on its own terms and give it the chance to, to speak first and maybe not even speak first, but show you the creativity on display um, that the countless people who put work into the movie, um, those are all creative individuals, artists, blessed with those gifts by God, and to consider how does this movie work? What is good about it? What is beautiful about it? And if there is an instance where I feel there is also something here that maybe I would have a different perspective on mm -hmm. or offer a different viewpoint, then I could offer that up after I've listened or watched or given the movie a chance to um, speak for itself. So it's just a, a slightly different approach. And maybe that's why I never felt it as any sort of strain or tension when I was reviewing this, these films. It was just that I'm someone coming to this movie, yes, with a particular background, a particular set of beliefs, but I'm coming to it to have a conversation with it more than to um, be so concerned about what sort of message it may be trying to force upon me. Understood. So there, there really is kind of a universal approach to assessing a film from a cinematography perspective, from a casting, from a thematic, uh, if it's uh, from a book, uh, drawing any correlation between <clears throat> the theme and the character development of the book itself. What most people don't know is uh, how screenplays are developed and what constitutes a movie. Uh, fortunately, I've, I've been involved in having a book uh, turned into a screenplay and a movie script is one page per minute of a movie. So if you have a s movie script of a book, and the book could be 600 pages, and it's a two-hour movie, the screenplay is 120 pages. It is one page per minute. And when you try to wrap your mind around how can you get Star Wars, how can you get uh, Lord of the Rings, how can you get War and Peace, The Wizard of Oz, all these things to the standard of one minute, one page and all that's added into it, it's really quite extraordinary what takes place from a print world into a visual world and how you navigate to that point. So <clears throat> we become the uh, bene beneficiaries, excuse me, we become the beneficiaries of a tremendous transitional process that's taken place over a period of not days, not weeks, not months, but years. And the life cycle of going from the day that Josh Larson published Movies or Prayers to the days that we might see this on the screen we're now talking about the soonest we could see it would be 2020, maybe 2021, if we were to take to make this into a movie. That's how involved and uh, the appreciation that I have, and I believe the appreciation that you have, of what it takes to even get there is monumental and the number of people and the number of, of components that go into it. So as a film critic, 
you had to also temper your point of view around the whole, the music, the choreography, the costuming, the theming, the writing, the dialogue, uh, all of these issues, Jason, yes. all of these issues uh, surrounding the development of a film. So we're looking at this uh, incredible dynamic of what it takes to be a film critic, what it takes for someone to uh, take that perspective and bring that perspective to a column uh, in a community that is going to influence one, the reader, as to whether or not it's a movie that they should attend, that they should watch, uh, what the underlying theme of the movie is, and not give away too much, but also to uh, be true to uh, the point of view or the particular perspective that Josh Larson brings to uh, this uh, article that he's written about a movie that he's seen. And it's not as much as he liked it or he didn't like it, but in writing uh, as a film critic, there are the highs, the lows, the outstandings, the mediocres, the uh, sometimes even the comparative analysis to similar work. So talking about what you did as a film critic, how you brought in a summary form an opinion. Uh, did you have a scoring or a rating system of your own that you had developed that gave it a, uh, uh, a one Josh or a five Josh as to uh, how you rated the films that you critiqued? How did you go about doing that. What were the criteria you used that were unique that made, it, made me want to read you? We, and you mentioned Siskel and Ebert. We knew every time we saw them, we knew what they were going to hone in on because we knew their personalities. We knew what they had the critical eye for. Okay? So when you were doing this, what was Josh Larson's critical eye? What were you bringing to the reader? Yeah, the rating system is sort of a necessary evil of this business, I would say, um, because part of me does hate to reduce a film to, like, they did a thumbs up or thumbs down or a certain number of stars or something like that. But it's very helpful for people, especially at a newspaper, to take a quick glance and say, okay, this got so many out of four stars or whatever the rating system would be. So I've stuck with that even on my own website that I have now where I do some writing. I have star ratings because uh, it's, it's a handy shorthand, and I understand that. Um, but one of the reasons I don't like it is because – um, it's just so reductive. You were talking um, and quite accurately about all the work that goes into a movie production and all those steps along the way from a script to the screen, the many, many people whose hands are on it from production designers to costume designers to editors and on and on and to just have something they put out in the world after so many years of work reduced to so many out of four stars is, you know, it's it's disrespectful in a lot of ways. So yes. what I like to do instead is go in as open as possible to a film and not necessarily bring a rubric to it that it needs to meet. So there isn't a checklist. There isn't, um, you know, an area where here I'm going to put my notes about cinematography here. I'm going to put my notes about editing. Uh, it's more looking at what is the movie giving me? And it happens to be a film that the editing is very crucial to what that movie wants to do and it's doing that skillfully, then that's what I'll write about. Um, it may be a performance. That's the most interesting thing in a movie. I found that to be case I found that to be the case with uh, the recent Alien film, Alien Covenant, where Michael Fassbender gives a dual performance there. Uh, that was the best thing about the movie, which otherwise had a lot of issues for me at least. So I really 
take what the movie gives me. Now, I think out of that, and after a while, if you read a critic, even a critic who takes that approach, you will find that there are certain things they appreciate about films. There are certain things that really bother them about films. Um, and you'll start to pick up those tendencies. Mm-hmm. Um, but maybe that's something better that uh, for, better for someone to answer who has read a certain critic for a while or listened to a certain critic for a while. You don't limit yourself to G, PG, PG-13 movies. Uh, on your site, larsononfilm.com, you do reviews on R-rated movies uh, to the ministry community, to the believing community. Uh, when we look at the ratings and we uh, look at family relevancy to connection to faith, are there um, uh, guidelines that you use? Does your faith come into play in looking at um, and a question that always comes to my mind if I happen to see a movie is the movie on its own had great value the language diminished the value there was no reason for 150 repetitions of a word that I find to be unacceptable in my own vocabulary. Or uh, nothing was gained in the film. The overall value of the film and the messaging by having uh, nudity or partial nudity introduced or uh, why? Why in, in some cases it's fairly obvious that it adds nothing to the film and almost becomes a marker of that film, a distinguishing factor that, in my mind, as a minister, uh, is really quite negative. Yeah, well, you're asking, you're asking the right question, which is the same question that a critic should ask, is why? And you're applying it to particular elements of a film but you could apply that to every element of a film. So why are they making these choices when it comes to the cinematography, the particular lighting in this scene? Why are they doing that? Why have they lit it this way? What does that do for the overall purpose of this film? And that's the good question to ask when it comes to things like language or like nudity as well, Uh, because there are many cases, you're right, where it is simply, it's unnecessary or it's exploitative, um, it's objectifying, Uh, in terms of nudity, but there are maybe cases where there is another reason it is being employed in that film for the story that it wants to tell. So those are the good questions to ask. And I do note in the beginning of the book, the um, foreword, or actually the first chapter, that, you know, there are going to be R-rated films here, because this is not necessarily a consumer's guide for Christians approach to film, which does have its place and i know that people are grateful for that i myself use something like common sense media um, in helping to decide what might be appropriate for my own kids if it's something i'm not familiar with so certainly outlets like that have their place Uh, but that's not what this project was geared toward necessarily and it comes back to what i was talking about this recognition that um, these movies much like our prayers i might add uh, are being offered up by flawed people. Um, we don't offer perfect prayers. Um, sometimes our prayers, sometimes we ask for the wrong things. Sometimes we use the wrong words. Sometimes we are um, not even really paying attention if we're doing it in church liturgy. So even our prayers are flawed. And so there's a recognition here that movies, again, there's going to be some good with the bad. They're going to be mixed bags to a certain degree. And that doesn't mean that every Christian needs to sit with that mixed bag. I also want to emphasize that I am not throwing discernment out the window. Um, Discernment is something that we definitely need to bring to our viewing practices. Discernment, however, I also would argue is something that is very personal. And by that I mean 
we each need to decide what is not good for us to view as part of our faith walk. What might make me stumble more than someone else? Understood. We're talking with Josh Larson, author of Movies Are Prayers, How Films Voice Our Deepest Longings. When we come back from break, we're going to dig into uh, some of the very interesting concepts behind this uh, of how particular genres of movies are our prayers, prayers of praise, yearning, lament, anger, confession, reconciliation, obedience, and more. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. Shalom. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, Executive Director of Ignatic Nation and host of the daily TV program Revealing the Truth, seen live every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time at www.ianbn.com and then replayed throughout the day and night via our website. All of our segments can be seen on the Ignatia Nation YouTube channel. Since our launch in January of this year, we've expanded our global reach to over 54 countries with a social media following of over 125,000. Our commitment is to bring you the most in-depth interviews with authors, subject matter experts, and thought leaders from around the world. We have interviewed guests from Israel, Brazil, England, India, and all across North America. All of our authors are featured on the books and media page on our website, www.ianbn.com. There you can find a direct link to the book you want to order, and we receive a small commission directly from Amazon. There is no cost to you for this service. In addition to our daily teachings and interviews, we make available to you the archive of all of the interviews on our YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram channels. Our live program is available from our homepage, and there is never a charge to you for any of this access. We made the decision long ago that we would remain a commercial-free resource that would not be influenced by any pressure from any outside company. There are only two ways that we are able to continue to operate this ministry and provide you with the only live, four-hour daily Christian television talk show program. The first is through your support and tax-deductible contributions to Igniting a Nation. These can be made directly through the donate button on the website or sent through the mail to Igniting a Nation, 2700 Corporate Drive, Suite 120, Birmingham, Alabama, 35242. The other way we support the program is by offering you a unique opportunity to have access to over 10 years worth of teachings on a subscription basis. The teaching archives contains all of my prior sermons, Torah studies, prophecy in the news videos, and much more for the low subscription price of $5 per month. This subscription grants you unlimited access to over 800 hours of content not available elsewhere and is updated weekly with the most current prophecy classes. In addition to 20 hours of original TV programming each weekday, we invite you to join us live every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday evenings for our Prophecy in the News classes. The times and locations are listed on our events page on the website www.ianbn.com. Every day you and I are faced with the challenge of where we will go to hear the truth. We are committed to bring you the only program of its kind that covers the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. We cannot do this without your support. Since we launched on January 5, 2017, we have aired over 300 individual teachings, interviews, and commentaries not available anywhere else. We are now working side by side with almost every major Christian publishing house to bring you the most in-depth feature interviews possible. Our one-hour features address every subject that affects the believer's life. We are hearing of salvations from the Middle East, Africa, and all across the United States. Lives are being changed every day, and we have only just begun. Our mission is to become your trusted resource and grant you access to the people, tools, and information you need to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You can help us by liking us on social media and through your financial support. 
We know you have many choices and who you support, but we are prayerfully asking you to consider helping us keep revealing the truth, true to our calling, to cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth like no other program available. Donate today and help us bring the message to the four corners of the earth. Visit www.ianbn.com and donate, buy a book, or subscribe to our teaching archives. Without you, we do not exist. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're visiting with Josh Larson, author of Movies Are Prayers, How Films Voice Our Deepest Longings. Josh, welcome back to the program. Thank you. Josh, you open the book with chapter one. What's unique about chapter one in a book that has 11 chapters it is the only chapter that begins with a title that ends with a question mark. Right. An unusual uh, tool, if you will, in the opening title of the first chapter, which is Movies Are Prayers? Question mark. Right. The question mark is basically to acknowledge that this is a somewhat strange idea, a different approach to talking about films and putting them within the context of faith. And so I'm allowing for that and making room for a little pushback perhaps, but then also giving myself the space to make the case um, for the ways that movies can function similarly to the prayers that we regularly practice in our faith lives. When you were working on this book, this project, and you began to take your childhood experiences, your professional experiences. What, what drove you to look at movies having a prayer correlation or a prayer connection to them? It was really my experience of them and recognizing that some of the ways these movies were working for me, the ways I saw them function, did mirror the prayers that were a part of my faith life, whether those were in my private devotional time or part of the church liturgy I practice. I started to see some parallels there. And once I explored that more deeply and looked more closely at the faith tradition and what prayers of lament meant, what prayers of confession meant, biblically looking at biblical models um, and also liturgical models, mm -hmm. then they would also point out to me other films that would come to mind and I would think, yeah, I've what I've experienced when I've offered this prayer of lament, I've also experienced when I've watched this particular film. So that was sort of the germ of the idea for the project, and then it was a matter of spending the time to educate myself better on forms of prayer and also look more closely at these particular films and see, do they really work this way, or is this just kind of a stretch? And, and I, had to, I had to get rid of a bunch that did not pan out, but then there were some where those parallels rang true, and I pursued them further. And a lot of this came out of my work with um, thinkchristian.net, which is my day job, um, I'm the editor there, and we look at all of culture um, through a faith perspective and ask, what does this mean for us as Christians, whether it's a scientific development, technological development that's in the news, um, whether politics come into play, or even something like sports. And we just say, okay, let's look at this piece of culture and think about it through our faith. Here, because my particular background is in film criticism, I applied that to movies. Interesting. Is this in some form or fashion an effort to extract a redeeming quality even out of a nightmare on Elm Street, even <laughs> on the character of Freddy Krueger, even uh, extracting some uh, redeeming quality of, as I look at the uh, list of movies referenced um, Silence of the Lambs uh, and, and that correlated to a prayer of obedience. 
so Hannibal Lecter, A Prayer of Obedience, helped me see in the silence of the lambs how through your lens this brought about an understanding or pierced you in a way that would have you look at it as a prayer of obedience. Yeah, I, I missed uh, some of those titles. I know you mentioned A Nightmare on Elm Street and Signs of the Lambs. In general, we're talking about the, the horror um, category here. And many Christians have written about um, horror as being the place where morality is at its most stark in terms of certain behaviors, certain ways we have chosen to live. When we pursue the wrong ways, here are the repercussions. Um, that is, uh, you know, a, a very sort of Old Testament approach to interpreting some of those films. And I think a lot of them do work that way, where there is a recognition of darkness and then the cost also of darkness. Um, I think horror films, uh, and, you know, the, the category that I put horror films in is in... Um, yeah, where I'm looking at here, because I was thinking of Hitchcock, too, which some people would consider horror. Right. And I put him more in prayers of confession. But a lot of the horror films you mentioned are in the category of obedience. And this is to almost see the cost of not offering obedience. Okay? It's the flip side of the coin a lot of times in some of these films. Uh, now, in that message there is some very rough stuff, as you acknowledged, in something like A Nightmare on Elm Street, um, where we are confronted very much with fear and feel that fear as viewers. Now, you may say as your own personal discernment, referencing what we were talking about earlier, I don't need that in my life. And that is completely legitimate. So this is not to make the case that every Christian needs to see A Nightmare on Elm Street. It is more, again, what I mentioned at the very top, what is A Nightmare on Elm Street doing? How is it creating this sense of fear? And then asking myself, given my faith perspective, what can I pull from that, that the things the movie is doing might speak to? Um, and so that's where A Nightmare on Elm Street is, you know, an incredibly well-crafted film. Yes, it's very frightening, and uh, there is a very explicit gore in that picture, and that's why I would say if that is not something you feel like you need in your life, I completely understand that. Well, as you're talking, it's occurring to me that uh, you reach a stage in life when you reflect back on things. I looked at your list and said, yeah, before I became a believer, yeah, I saw that, I saw that, I saw that, I saw that, I saw that. Uh, looking for the redemptive qualities of anything is part of our pursuit as believers. Uh, I, I kind of equate it to these television shows like Gold Rush or the ones where these guys are mining through l literally millions upon millions of pounds of dirt. They are spending 24 hours a day digging through dirt and the focus is not on the dirt the focus is on this little pile this tiny little pile that can fit in your hand that it took a million pounds of dirt to yield that and that is the focus that is the redemptive quality of sifting through all that dirt is the gold at the end of the show. I watched the show to get, I could fast forward because all I want to see is the way in because I think that's the cool part. Now, when I look back on every believer's life, your journey has exposed you to books, to art forms, to movies that have had some impact on you, some you're cognizant of, Others, you are not aware of the impact. It has had a spiritual impact, but you may not be cognizant of it. Would you find that for those who have reached a point where they uh, 
would like to be able to find some of the redeeming qualities of some of the influences of their youth, some of the influences of their life, or even a way to influence their family to look for the redemptive quality, whether or not it's of a movie, which is in this case your focus, or of a book, or of any activity. Does this kind of set uh, for the reader a way to uh, focus on the good part, that gold nugget that may be contained within uh, those mounds of dirt? Yeah, I certainly hope so. I, I do hear from younger Christians in particular, college age or a little older, who are saying, you know, exactly what you said. I, I've maybe been a Christian, but I've watched all these movies as a kid, and I'm just now starting to think about how they fit with my faith life. And so I would hope that this offers one way for Christians to do that, yet at the same time, I'll keep emphasizing it's different for each person depending on their faith. And there may be someone who struggles with uh, a certain whatever it might be, whatever addiction you might want to describe it as, mm -hmm. and to watch a certain type of film does not help them with that struggle. And for that person, I would say absolutely then, you can be more discriminating, more limiting in the movies that you see, because they are not going to be fruitful for your spiritual life. So I really do think that um, discernment is crucial here. And I would emphasize, you know, when you're talking about you may not even know the spiritual toll, however you might want to phrase it. Um, I always try to point out that discernment is done well in community, and that might be different for different people. If you're um, a young single person, maybe it is a group of friends who you say, um, let's go to the movies regularly together and then talk about them in the light of just the movies, but also our faith and these things that you're speaking concerned about. Uh, maybe it's a spouse who you have, um, who you say, this is what I'm watching, and you watch things together, and there can be some accountability in that sort of community as well. Church groups, this is what I think is so exciting about seeing church groups that have movie groups. Um, you know, I know people differ about showing movie clips during the service and the sermon itself. I'm not a preacher, um, so that's not what I do. But I am very encouraged when I see that there are groups, small groups at churches who get together, watch films, and provide that sense of discernment for each other. Because, um, yes, this is not something um, we should do lightly when we're immersing ourselves so deeply in these cultural artifacts. Um, and so I think it's important to do it with discernment and in community. As a critic... <clears throat> And as an author who has taken these movies that you've used as examples uh, and put them into the various classifications that they ministered to you, uh, nowhere in the book do you say this was the author's intent. And nowhere in the book do you say that this was the screenwriter's intent. This was the filmmaker's intent. Uh, so this is not a guide to uh, plug into the heart of, uh, of uh, I can't even think of a director right now, uh, uh, Steven Spielberg. Uh, sure. It's, it's looking at the dynamic of a plot line and character development and using through a biblical lens a way to extract what the heart of that person is. What is it that they're, they're going through? Can I relate to that? And can I relate to that in the form of prayer that this is kind of, uh, Lord, I, I really do feel like that character. I really do. It, it gives us a... Uh, tangible form of expression that we may not have had some something to relate to. I, I feel this, but I, I, I don't know anybody else that feels this way. I, nobody's ever shared that with me, but I happen to see in a movie 
And the character of Bob, man, I really identify with the character of Bob. Bob, on the screen, that's how I feel, Lord, and I need you. That's, that's what I'm saying to you. Help me like you help Bob. Uh, is, that, is that part of this messaging? Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm glad you picked up on that element of it because uh, that's certainly the way I look at films as almost their own. Once they've gone through that long process you outlined and had so many creative hands on them, frequently, yes, there will be a strong person in control, often the director, um, but still, even in a Steven Spielberg film, there have been many other creative hands at play and uh, it becomes, in my mind, its own living thing, essentially, that is open to, it then opens itself up to the audiences. And what we also bring in response to the film becomes equally as important. Now, there are different lines of critical thought when uh, this comes up. Some people are very much auteurists, so they want to look at a film as a singular vision from one person. And... Sometimes that can be interesting. Certainly we can see all the commonalities in Steven Spielberg's films. The themes that pop up a lot, the different way things are shot with the camera, the lighting, the music he uses. Um, so I do enjoy looking at films through that lens sometimes as well. But what I really believe is because of that creative process, movies become their own things at the end of the day. And that is what makes engaging with them so fun so that people can bring their own experiences of life their own worldviews and again not necessarily to get into a fighting match with the movie but just say here's how i'm experiencing the film because of who i am um, and maybe what i believe and what i appreciate about the cinema itself so that's certainly uh the aspect that uh, i wanted to emphasize in the book uh, I, I think it's a, a unique uh, approach. I don't know of any other work like it that has looked at a way to extract from uh, a common, ordinary experience attending a movie and going back and then thinking of it in a way that helps frame it for you biblically as a believer, puts it back into a certain context without becoming a Christian movie critic or looking at everything through a Christian lens uh, in a Christian biblical worldview, which is what I maintain and what I endeavor to maintain, but allows the reader to kind of take a journey through how you develop this perspective why you develop this perspective, how you apply this perspective, and you give them examples of it, which should lay a foundation that says that once I'm done reading the book, I can now go to a movie and I can go with a hunger for a redeeming quality to a connection point. Uh, I've often said that if you go to a restaurant right after you had a meal, you could be at the best restaurant in the world, you have no appetite, the food is horrible. But if you have not eaten in four days and you walk into a store and you're given a can of Beanie Weenies, it will be the most savory meal that you can remember in recent times giving the reader a tool to go into an unknown because the concept of a movie is presented to us in a 60 second trailer. We're walking into the unknown. We may know the plot line, that is one line of the plot, uh, with an expectation. But this adds another dimension to expectation which is application and I don't know of any other book or any other approach that does it uh, in this way uh, we just have a couple minutes left and I do want to bring up what I brought up uh, in our opening remarks 
which was Phantom of the Opera. Uh, before I came to faith as a middle-aged man, Jewish man, uh, Phantom of the Opera was highly entertaining. Uh, the music, the movie, everything was engaging. The craftsmanship, the choreography, the set design, the character selection, the dialogue, uh, impeccable. And when I came to faith, and I had the opportunity several years later to see it again, I was vexed. I was moved to the point of seeing it as an homage to Satan, that the very words of Satan, Lucifer, coming out of the phantom's mouth, come to me, I'm the angel of the night, and I'm looking at all of these words and all of these characteristics, and this is that satanic call, this wooing, and how could I have never seen that before? Well, because I wasn't a believer. I didn't, uh, the concept of heaven and hell and good and evil was, uh, yes, I was raised in the synagogue and I was taught and trained, uh, but now I have this new faith worldview, this new biblical lens, and I'm seeing and hearing and seeing this is the character. This is, this is truly an homage to Satan himself. Uh, the angel of the night, come perform for me. I'll take you. You come serve me. And, uh, and I've, I've shared that before, uh, not discouraging people from going to see it, but saying, hey, if you see it, let me know if it impacted you the way it impacted me. And it has incredibly impacted me because I saw probably the first real on earth, not horror film, which is what we think of when we think of, of Satan. I saw in this eloquent, elegant, operatic, musical, Andrew Lloyd Webber, Broadway production, the life and times of Satan on earth. And that was the message I came away with and I've probably seen it. I, I saw it opening night on Broadway uh, many, many years ago. Amazing, wonderful, stunning, the music. Yeah, I still remember the songs. The, it's hard to forget many of them. Uh, but I came away with that view, so I understand the impact uh, that it can have uh, if we look at it through a particular uh, lens. Uh, you're well familiar with the movie. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Were, are you referring to the, I think the most recent movie is maybe 15 years ago yes, now? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And what you're describing there is exactly what we're talking about, how this particular film spoke to you because of your experience yes. and your faith perspective. And, you know, I don't, when you use a word like homage, that gets into the territory where we're now placing that on the filmmakers and saying this was their intent from the beginning, right. which I don't know that that's necessarily the case with the Phantom of the Opera, but for you and for your experience and where you're at in your life, that is how the movie functioned. Exactly, exactly. We've been talking with Josh Larson. We've unfortunately run out of time. I want to encourage you to get this book, Movies or Prayers, How Films Voice Our Deepest Longings. It will give you a new perspective, a new tool in your arsenal a new piece of equipment that will allow you to see films, which you're probably going to see anyways, to add to it a new view, new perspective, a new application to your journey with the Lord, to be able to relate to ways and forms of prayer relative to a movie you've seen in a way that you've never seen before. Josh Larson, thank you for joining us and sharing with us Movies or Prayers. We want to thank you again for being with us right here on Revealing the Truth. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for the conversation. You're welcome. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.